This is a production of Cornell University. So we've talked about these parent, parent materials. We've talked about the geologic cycle. We haven't talked a lot about, we talked about the chemical and physical weathering. But we haven't, so we've talked about the transformation end of this. But we actually haven't talked about the transportation end of this. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about how these things get moved because the movement of these materials is also part of the weathering. I mean, certainly if I start talking about water, well, water is weathering, but it's also moving material. Wind is weathering, but it's also moving material. Gravity happens. OK, so here's that diagram down here. And basically what we're going to look at is this is a schematic of how these materials move and the portions that are turned into soil and sort of the, the, the flow chart of it. OK, so let's start right here with exposed igneous rock. We've come up and we're now exposed. At this point, I could have weathering. And if I have weathering and surface formation, I could produce soils. Now, this material can also be exposed to heat and pressure and basically be turned into a metamorphic rock. Back to the question that you brought up. Okay? This can be weathered. And superficial processes happen, soil formation happens, and we can have a soil there as well. Okay? If it is superficially weathered, this material can be weathered and transported, and it can become unconsolidated material. Okay, it can be turned into sedimentary rock, but this material, through weathering and soil formation, can become soil, and in turn can go back to be unconsolidated material. Does that make sense to everybody? This material can be buried, cemented. This basically comes at cemented, cemented rock, sedimentary rock. It can be uplifted, and it can become exposed sedimentary material. This is unconsolidated material. This is the stuff that was weathered away from here. Okay? This sedimentary, exposed, weathering, and surface or soil formation can produce soils. If this goes under heat and pressure, it can become a metamorphic rock, and the cycle continues. Ultimately, it doesn't matter where you are on this chart, ultimately, you're going to be subducted again, turned back into magma, and the cycle will start again with exposed igneous rock. Now, this is a geologic cycle, a lot, lot longer than a soil cycle, which is a lot, lot longer than a biological cycle. OK? Good handle on this? Because I want to talk about some. We've been talking about the soil formation. We've been talking about the minerals. But I want to start talking about the transport. Sediment transport. How does this stuff move around? Okay, there's a number of different agents of transportation. The first one we're basically going to talk about is wind. Okay, I have introduced you to this because I've talked about LUS, that very first soil pit that we went to, periglacial environment. The glaciers recede enough that the lake's levels drop. What happens? We have this cold body up there, we got this warm body down there. We create lots of convection currents, lots of winds. That wind selectively picks up the silt and redeposits it. An aeolian deposit. Make sense? Lust. Okay? You can have aeolian sits. So this is the lust, but you can also have aeolian sands. Okay? The sand doesn't actually get picked up, it gets saltated, but basically what you're looking at is you're looking at sand dunes. Where I'm looking at blowing material, it's not going high, it's just being blown. Okay? Sand hills in Nebraska, any beach dune that you think of, the Sahara, these big, huge, sort of sandy areas. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Luss has excellent sorting. Why? Do you guys remember the whole story about why it's selectively picking up the silt over everything else? Right? Why is it it's selectively picking up silt? Because it's not large and it's aerodynamic. And unlike clay, it doesn't stick together. So it acts as an individual, individual particle. Now, the important thing here is when you think about this lust material, you say excellent sorting. Well, you, we always think of, well, it's sorting the dust. It's putting the silt on top. But at the same time, it's also <coughs> sorting out the parent material from which it came. Because it's selectively picking the silt out, which means everything else is being left behind. Sorting. OK? Vertical uniform particle size is coming down as large components. The wind is uniform energy 
you're getting large vertical depths. Okay? And it's also a deep rapid weathering because if I have small particles, a lot of surface area exposed, it's going to weather very quickly. Now you saw that on the arc port soils. What happened to that less material? It weathered quickly, turned into clay, and where did that clay go? That's where we got the clay bands. Those soils, parameter-wise, there is no clay there at all. Sand down below, silt, yet we find bands of clay in it. It's because we're looking at the weathered silt moving down. OK, wind is pretty powerful stuff. This is basically sandblasted. The sand, the particles in the air, is doing the grinding. The wind itself isn't doing the grinding, but the wind is the carrier for that sand, basically driving through. Okay. Now, it's interesting to take a look at this feature because one would think if I got sandblasting, I'd have it all throughout the whole thing. But the reality is we've got to go back to this sorting equation. There's vertical partitioning here. The wind is only picking up the sand so far. It's not like it's picking silt up and carrying it you know, miles. And you heard me tell you that the Caribbean and basically the southeast of the United States is being fertilized by dust from Africa. It's not sand that's coming across, though. And this is a perfect example. Where is that sand weathering the stuff away? Down here. If it was high, it would be weathering this whole thing. You'd have a column. Does that make sense? We also have ice. Let's say glaciation advancing across the north of the United States and Europe. But basically, this material pushes through, and it grinds stuff up, but it also carries stuff with it. Okay? Because of its process, this material is basically unsorted. It's everything, everything from huge, gigantic boulders all the way down to clay-sized stuff. Because it's not just transporting it. As it's transporting it, things are being ground up more. So even if I started as a boulder way up in Canada, potentially by the time it made it down here, it's not going to be a boulder anymore. It's going to be clay-sized stuff. And so as a result, you get this unsorted, loose mixture of everything, particles from clay to boulder size. Um, so we're talking about ice transportation, OK? And we're basically looking at this unsorted, uh, loose mix of basically everything, OK? Of all different kinds of sizes, shapes, colors, materials, mineral types, everything, OK? The interesting thing about this is they get classically deposited in very classic forms. And these are examples of the till plain moraines, came kettles, eskers, all of these, they're very distinct in their formation, okay, when they're laid. Okay? Um, some ice distribution. This is, uh, you got a lot of boulders, you got some rounded. So this was actually, there was some water distribution in here, but you're looking at a complete mix of materials. Fines all the way up to large. Okay? Another example is potentially this. I don't know, can you guys see this? It's an old picture. But we're looking at rock debris that was basically from the, directly from the gla glacier melting ice. You know, it just basically came off. And you can just sort of see, you know, it's just it's this really thick mix of everything. OK. Uh, we also have water transportation. Water is transporting as well as weathering, just as the ice and the wind is. OK. We have glacial outwash. These are water deposits that are basically coming from this melting glacier. This is a sort of a pseudo. This is not necessarily till, but this is, we call it till. This is, a mix of water drop stuff, ice drop stuff, just basically dropped. Okay, we have lacustrian. This is clays, the lake laid stuff, and then we have alluvial stuff, which is the streams, floods, moving things. Okay, here are some examples. These are more water erosion and depositions, but you're looking at the water cutting into that, water cutting into this, and moving things farther downstream. And this is the downstream. You can sort of see these strategy. I don't know if you see these sort of lines. You can sort of see it moving up. Here's another one. But basically, you're looking at the sands and materials basically laid on top of it. This is pretty deep. I mean, there's a person. You can see the soil forming at the surface up here. And these darker horizons way up at the top. This is all that water deposited materials. Um, I threw this in, in here because this, is a, I, this looks like it's rock. But this is actually what we call, this is lake laid material. And this is actually very large varving, V-A-R-V-I-N-G. I think it's I-N-G. 
And basically what's happening here is you're looking at seasons. Winter time, the lakes freeze over. Okay. Summertime, they're open, which means wind can move across the water. Now, if wind moves across the water, it may not be a lot of energy, but it's enough energy that it creates some turbulence in the water, and it keeps the finer particles in suspension. Wintertime happens, and it ices over. That wind isn't there anymore. Okay? Water isn't flowing into the lakes anymore. The water column gets calmer, and finer particles come out of suspension. Does that make sense? And so as a result, you have a stratigraphy of course to fine, course to fine, course to fine. And you can actually see the layers. Okay, it's called varving. And when we get up to, uh, I think, about three weeks, four weeks, I'm hoping to dig a borehole down and we can pull this stuff up. It comes up, this is really big stuff. I mean, you can see the size of the leaf. This is thick stuff. But the stuff that we find around here, fairly thin, and it comes up like a very platy texture, a platy structure. Because what's happening is you, the clays that came that settled in the wintertime are forming, forming chips. And then the sand that was there being laid in the, in the summertime is basically the break points. And so you can take this, and it looks like it's just chips. It's pretty interesting stuff. And we also have gravity. Okay? Gravity happens. It carries materials short distance down slopes. Basically erosion. This gravity transported material we call colluvium. And here's sort of a concept slide of it. Material that's up here, gravity pulls down and creates this material, this deposit right here. This angle here is called the angle of repose. It's basically the angle that the material can hold its bearing strength on. Okay. Buffalo Street. Now if Buffalo you know Buffalo Street. You guys, everybody know what Buffalo Street, that really steep street that goes straight down to the commons or just to the, south, uh, just to the north of the commons? Extremely steep. That is a stream delta. It was a stream delta that was formed underwater, so its angle of repose is a lot steeper. If that, stream, that same stream was depositing stuff above water, no, not in the lake, that stream delta would not be formed like this. That stream delta would be formed like this. Right? Does that make sense? Gravity depositions, you're basically looking at this colluvial material just sliding down slope. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.